Good day, and welcome to Epstein Becker Green and EBG Advisors webinar, Can Population Health Management Interventions Help State Medicaid Plan Offerings? Before we begin today's presentation, please be informed that today's webinar is being recorded and the participant phone lines will be placed on mute throughout the program. You are welcome to submit questions throughout the program by using the Q&A feature provided by WebEx, and at the end of the program, with time permitting, the speakers will address your questions. You are also welcome to submit questions directly to the presenters following the webinar, and contact information will be displayed at the end of the presentation. In approximately two to three business days following the webinar, Epstein Becker Green will communicate the availability of the webinar recording and access to the PowerPoint materials. We are pleased to have two fantastic speakers today, Epstein Becker Green's Clifford E. Barnes, who is a member of the firm in the healthcare and life sciences practice in the firm's Washington, D.C. and New York offices, and serves as co-chair of the firm's health plan compliance group, and Joe Park, MD, director, Missouri HealthNet, a division of the Missouri Department of Social Services. At this time, I'd like to turn the webinar over to Clifford E. Barnes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have the great privilege of having uh, Dr. Joe Parks uh, present to us uh, today on what I think is a very exciting topic, uh, and that is can population health management interventions help state Medicaid plan offerings? Uh, we, we got just a little sense of uh, what Dr. Parks uh, is involved in, but uh, it's only just a little sense. Dr. Parks is uh, uh, a person who keeps himself busy. He wears a number of hats, at least three, and the first three I'll describe right now. Currently, Dr. Parks is the director of the Missouri uh, Health Net, which is their Medicaid authority in Jefferson, uh, 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 Jefferson City, Missouri. In addition, he serves as uh, the Distinguished Research Professor of Science at the University of Missouri, St. Louis, and is a Clinical Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Missouri, Department of Psychiatry at Columbia. He also practices psychiatry on an outpatient basis at Family Health Center, a federally funded community health center established to expand services to uninsured and underinsured patients in central Missouri. So uh, Dr. Park serves at a number of different levels, which means he has, in my view, a very interesting and uh, uh, distinguished uh, or at least distinct perspective, having being at the state level, being at the community level, and also being uh, at uh, and, and teaching. Prior to these experiences, uh, Dr. Parks uh, served as medical director of the Missouri Department of Mental Health, as president of the Medical Directors Council of the National Association of State Men Mental Health Program Directors. He also previously served as director of Missouri Institute of Mental Health at Missouri at the University of Missouri, St. Louis, and as the Division Director of the Division of Comprehensive Psychiatric Services at Missouri Department of Mental Health. Dr. Parks has authored and co-authored a number of articles, monographs, technical papers, and has reviewed articles on behavioral health services, delivery, and policy. Uh, Dr. Parks is a recipient of several leadership awards, including from the University of Missouri Columbia Department of Psychiatry, the Missouri Hospital Association, Missouri Primary Care Association, the Missouri Chapter of Mental Health uh, America. He has also received Innovation and Quality Improvement Awards, including the American Psychiatric Association, URAC, SAMHSA, the Missouri Governor's Award for Quality and Productivity, and the Missouri Governor's Pinnacle Award for Quality and Pro Productivity. Without uh, going much further, though I could, uh, I will introduce Dr. Park so he can begin uh, the webinar today. Dr. Park? 
Thank you very much, Clifford. I, I appreciate the kind introduction very much, and I'm pleased to be here on the webinar. If we could advance the slides, we'll get started. Uh, I'm going to be talking about how state Medicaid programs are moving increasingly towards population health management and what we mean by that. In particular, I'm going to go over first what's meant by population health, then what's meant what the techniques of population health management are. After that, I'll talk why that's particularly important for populations with mental illness and substance abuse, behavioral health conditions. And then I'll give an example of how, uh, one example of a way we implemented that here in Missouri. There's many ways to pursue population health. Go ahead. So here's two of my favorite definitions. If you go looking into it, you'll find a whole lot of definitions that have significant overlap but are, have a fair, significant amount of variation also. Pop, uh, the aspects I want to point out here is this: the first definition is the health of population measured by health status. So population health is about measurement. Uh, and it's also about social, economic, and physical environments, personal health practices, individual capacity and coping, biology, and finally, health services. Population health really requires us to focus on social determinants, physical environments, and behavior as opposed to strictly on the service environment or on the physiology alone. This is a, a big change in the level of demand on either a payment system or on a healthcare delivery system. As a policymaker and as a, as a civil servant, I also find it useful to use it as a conceptual framework for thinking about why some populations are healthier than others, and then the policy development, research agenda, and research allocation that flow through it, from it. And all of our, many of our listeners I know are experiencing some of those changes in resource allo allocation uh, as the uh, Account Affordable Care Act rolls on out. Go ahead. So here's, uh, you've probably seen graphs like this before, and this is one reason we need to move towards population health management. This shows health rankings by the association that represents people that run departments of public health. So this really looks at total health. Now there's other rankings you can find that shows the U.S. ranks very high in treating serious illnesses like cancer. We build a healthcare system that gives the best rescue care in the world but isn't very good at giving general care, preventive care, and basic care, and hence the low rating here. Uh, the uh, Affordable Care Act and industry forces in general are pushing us more and more towards attending to preventive care and basic health care. Uh, it's going to be a tough shift from our huge focus on being excellent at rescue care. Go ahead. Uh, so the factors that influence health, the take home point here is that clinical interventions are up on the pyramid here. They are some of the less pervasive, less broad factors. The broadest influences on health are socioeconomic factors. Secondarily are behavioral factors, how people, how people act, how they live their day-to-day -day lives. Go ahead. So population health needs to be impacting those behavior factors and to the extent possible the socioeconomic and social determinants of health. Uh, it is hard to change behavior and it's harder to change our socioeconomic environment, but succeeding in the future to get better health at lower costs requires that our industry do both. Uh, population health thinks of a continuum of care, starting with healthy people, moving to people that are at risk, and then people with chronic conditions, and finally the complicated cases. What I'll show you today, we'll talk about a population approach to people with complex problems, uh, but treating them through a population approach as opposed to a complaint-driven approach. What I probably won't get in far enough today is what is more the meat and potatoes of population health? What do we do with the healthy and the at-risk population? How we identify people early? You see on the bottom arrow some of the common interventions that are used, workplace wellness, screening, health risk assessments, moving up through mobile health and data analytics, and finally into some of the more intensive interventions. Proceed. So to deliver population health management in any care setting, there are four basic uh, steps. You assess not just the individuals, but how they fit and become a population. You stratify what are your high-risk people, but what are all your, also your high-opportunity 
actionable, preventive, and early intervention. Population health is as much about addressing underutilization of key services as it is about addressing overutilization. You implement solutions and you measure and report back. It is very data driven. Go ahead. The principles of population health management is, is population based. It's not one patient, one off at a time. It's data driven. We're using large databases to pick out who needs what kind of care, who has actionable care gaps. It is increasingly evidence based care. Uh, it is patient centered. Uh, and, and attempts to address the social determinants of health. This is a stretch for our current providers. They're doing better at getting into team care. The providers I work are very excited and accepting of working in teams instead of in segregated groups. And, in, and you've heard the national-wide trend towards integration of behavioral and primary care, and I'll give you some data on why that's important and why it's occurring. Go ahead. So one uh, so population-based care, it's a move away from complaint-driven care. If you think about it now, we depend on the patient to figure out when they're sick enough to need care, to pretty much decide who they need to see and what care they, they decide to ask for. Now, this is not a real successful strategy, particularly in people that have three or four medical conditions, two or three behavioral health conditions, often don't have, some of whom have not finished high school, let alone have a college education, let alone have a clinical education, almost none of whom were healthcare administrators. And often their conditions give them difficulty with memory, concentration, perseverance on task, yet they are the people that are the major managers of the system in that they figure out when care is needed and who to go to to get this care. This is not a management strategy for success. Population health care doesn't rely on people on complaint-driven care. It uses data analytics to outreach both high utilizer, high need patients, but also to identify actionable care gaps, care that should be given, inappropriate underutilization of interventions that can uh, prevent disease from advancing uh, and catch it in an early stage. It also, in population-based care, you don't fix all the gaps all at once. You choose selected high prevalence care gaps and try and reduce the portion of their incidence within that population. It really demands that clinical providers and payers consider themselves to be the public health agency for either the clinic they work in or the population they are covering. It wants the payers again and the clinics to be the public health agency for the populations that they're either covering as an insurer or a payer or for the patients they're uh, taking care of directly. Go ahead. So I've said it's data driven, so I wanted to talk a little about data sources and some of the trade-offs. Uh, you can use claims, and I think claims are massively underutilized in care management. Uh, one strategy we've used here in Missouri is we make our claims available as an electronic health record. It doesn't have everything an electronic medical record has, but it has much more than most clinicians have. It has diagnoses, procedures, who the provider was, the date that it occurred. Uh, the provider themselves only knows the medication they prescribe. The payers know the medication that was actually filled and are in an ideal position to aggregate that across large number of payers. I believe all payers should be taking this information and pushing it back down to the providers that they are basically funding to allow them to do better care. It does not help the system to withhold the clinical portion of the claims information from the other providers involved. Uh, you can use electronic medical uh, medical record data extracts. Claims are very broad. You can get all payers in one place, but they're not deep. You can't get lab values, uh, exam results, uh, the more granular clinical information. Electronic medical records, you get deep, but not everybody's on an electronic medical record, and not all electronic medical records are hooked up to health information exchanges. So at the end, most practices only know about the data in their own electronic medical record, and, coordinate, and can only coordinate within their own system, but most patients don't get all their care from one system. You can also require practices record 
clinical values and send them in to create disease registries and to do risk stratification, predictive an analytics. Another major difference in performance health management that's transforming the view from the provider is performance benchmarking. You know, my duty as a physician is to practice within the reasonable standard of care, like all physicians. But how the heck do we know what that is? We know what the research tells us we ought to do, and we can read expert consensus papers of what experts think we should do in the average case, but we get almost no data back reporting to us what, we, what we're doing in aggregate as a group of physicians and where each individual lies within it. I don't know what percentile I am for completing metabolic screening compared to my peers. Most primary care doctors don't know what percentile they are for getting people on an inhaled cortical steroid for asthma compared to their peers. So it's incumbent, I believe, upon the payers and those of us that operate the system to find ways to give the individual providers meaningful benchmarking so they know where they are in the standard of practice. That's what will transform us from a cottage industry doing handicraft work into a real mature industry that's run by data and management principles. That, of course, requires a lot of data sharing, which will make your risk management officers very nervous. It'll make your general counsels very nervous. I always like to urge CEOs and other upper-level managers that there's a difference between the advice of your general counsel and a court order. General counsel gives advice, courts give orders, general counsels do not. I also like to remind CEOs that you have many kinds of liability to manage. Legal liability is just one of them. You have financial liabilities, public relations liabilities, operational liabilities, clinical liabilities, and the legal, the fear of legal risk should not trump all these other liabilities that you must manage. I think that helps you get a more balanced view of the value of data sharing. Proceed. So the method in population management, it selects from the whole population, those at most immediate risk, and then selects within those which have actionable improvement opportunities. There are high-risk people where you can't do much. Uh, it also gives you data that aids in planning care for the whole population. It helps you figure out what new interventions and programs you need. If you have something you can't solve with your current tools, maybe it's time to develop a new tool. It helps identify where you need to do more identification and prevention and where you need to have health education for both your staff and for the people you're caring for. Proceed. So those are data sources. How do we use data? Well, we can do aggregate reporting for system management for the kind of performance benchmarking. You know, we actually uh, do this around psychiatric prescribing in Missouri, this performance benchmarking, and we sort out and send letters to doctors that have higher rates of, oh, giving multiple antipsychotics or high doses of antipsychotics or who have a larger portion of their patients seeing multiple physicians for the same meds. And I, I find myself, since I practice, I actually get letters from myself at times asking me to do better. And it's, it's a strange experience. Why would I not be doing that already if I'm the guy that wrote the letter? Here's why practitioners need help. You know, you sit in the small room taking care of patients and they come in and they're suffering and they're desperate to feel better and you're desperate to help them. And you make a decision one day at a time and you make the best decision you do in the moment. What this kind of intervention does is it makes you step back and think where you are now and how you got there overall. It makes you step back and take a look at the big picture. Uh, and it, it results in changes and improvements. Performance benchmarking makes a difference. But that's looking at a whole range of patients. To do care management, you have to drill down on the individual. And to do population management, disease management, you have to have a registry, a sortable spreadsheet, or uh, some kind of aggregated sortable database where you can identify care gaps of groups of individuals and generate to-do lists for action by your care managers or by the treating providers. You also need the data for understanding what you're doing, planning and operations, and I think it's most important that we talk more about the data we have in healthcare as individual providers, as agencies, and as payers, and use data to tell a story. I think managing by data improves relationships, otherwise we're arguing about historical anecdotes, uh, and, and so negotiating with data helps us be easier on each other as individuals. Any conflict becomes a testable hypothesis we can run more data on. Go ahead. 
So the way you use this data is by developing eligibility enrollment registries. We use it in the payment system, of course. Uh, increasingly, practices are gaining efficiencies by using more data in their work processes. This is a huge transformation that population health will help the practices with. It gets them more used to using data. We've seen our community mental health centers and primary care practices that have gone to doing population health and the health home initiative we've done become more administratively skilled overall due to the demands that they use data more to manage clinically, they end up using data more to manage their business also. Go ahead, please. There's some important principles. People get lost in data. There's more data that we can look at. Uh, the principles we found useful are to use the data we have before asking the practices for more. To show as much data as we can to as many partners as often as we can. Sunshine improves data quality. I often think people err in keeping data secret till they're absolutely sure it's 100% accurate, and by then it's usually stale and nobody cares about it anymore. So it's important to show data early. You don't really know how good or bad it is till you get a lot of different eyes on it. Uh, the people you show it to, your partners, may actually use it to make better decisions. And again, it's better to debate about data than about speculative anecdotes. When I show data, I don't tell people what it means. I usually ask them what they think it means. And it's important to treat all criticisms of the results that they're inaccurate or misleading as testable hypothesis. The response should be, that's interesting input. How should we cut it? How should we rerun this data differently? You tend to overtax your data people unless you include them in the program design. Often those of us that do programmatic management give the data people an algorithm that we want them to calculate, and often there's a way that they could get 80% of the results in one week instead of the whole 100% we asked for in six weeks. So for much of the planning, it's good to tell them that approximate results quick are more important than precise results late. Uh, we treat all data runs as initial rough results. I've never seen a final data run yet in my entire 20-year career doing this. Important questions should use more than one analytic approach and, if possible, more than one analytic team to take a different look, see if you get ballpark the same result. That's why in Missouri we prefer to use several medium data analytic vendors as opposed to one big vendor. If there's one big vendor, then they'll make the same mistake again and again, and there's no way to cross-check. And we feel transparent benchmarking and showing results across multiple providers improves provider attention. They pay a lot more attention when they know other people are looking at their stuff too, and that increases involvement. Often initially that involvement can be stressful and uncomfortable, but it gets more comfortable over time. Our agencies need to be desensitized from insisting that others shouldn't see how they compare. Go ahead. The most important principles with data is perfect is the enemy of good. If you wait for perfection, you'll never get anything done. It's important to use an incremental strategy. If you try and figure out a comprehensive plan first, you'll never get started. And it's better to apologize for a failed prompt attempt than apologizing for a missed opportunity. Go ahead. So here's the six manage, population health management services. There's many ways to parse out population health management. I find this one useful, so I present it to you today. The six services are care management, finding care gaps within a population and within individuals that are actionable. Care coordination, organizing care across multiple providers and across multiple time periods. Managing transitions of care, most commonly from inpatient to outpatient. Health promotion, the behavior changes, healthy behaviors, preventive, things like vaccinations. And then down into the social determinants, individual and family support. How can we get people, help people be connected to a social network that helps them get to the pharmacy, that reminds them that they ought to do something when they're looking sicker? You know, Married people in general are healthier than single people because they get automatic case management. They get in-home case management every night, and they get better outcomes. And referral to community services, things like uh, assistance with uh, food stamps or heating or transportation is probably the biggest, one of the biggest barriers to people getting regular health care in America. And practices really need to assist with this, and payers need to assist with this. Otherwise, they're going to spend high dollars on emergency rooms because you can always get an ambulance to take you to the emergency room. 
if we avoid figuring out other ways for a person to get their transportation to the primary care office. Proceed. So comprehensive care management is identification and targeting high-use individuals. It's monitoring health status and also adherence to treatment. Uh, it's identifying and targeting those care gaps through individualized planning. Proceed. So how do you do this? Well, you create a registry. You can do that from electronic medical records, data extracts. You can do it from administrative claims. You can do it from survey data that practices report to you. You can either require that the registry be at the practice level, or you can run it centrally at the payer level. Uh, but you, the treating providers need to have online or immediate access to this registry where they can look and identify care gaps. So you compare the, your combined disease registry data into accepted clinical quality indicators. You identify the gaps. Then you sort them, and I'll give you a real life example here that we went on early. So we looked for everybody that had a diagnosis of asthma that was not on an inhaled cortical steroid. For those that were not on an inhaled cortical steroid, we sent out lists of those patients to the nurse care managers and asked them to arrange somebody to get them to primary care to see if they needed an inhaled cortical steroid. For those that were on an inhaled cortical steroid, we looked at their medication possession ratios, how frequently were they filling that prescription, and if they appeared non-adherent, they were only filling it three or four times a year, then we sent out lists of those patients to the nurse care managers to ask that they or one of their staff talk with the patient about why they weren't using their inhaled cortical steroid regularly and try and get them more adherent. Using these methods over two quarters, we're able to drive the percentage of people that either were not on an inhaled cortical steroid or were using it non-adherently down by 45%. The fascinating thing is, in that group, we got fewer ER visits, we expected that, but the number of psychiatric medications they were on dropped by an average of one. People with asthma taking more inhaled cortical steroids use less psych meds. Why would that be? Well, as it turns out, when you're not using an inhaled cortical steroid, you use your rescue inhaler, your Allupent, more often. And if you use that more than four to six times a day, you become nervous, jittery, and can't sleep at night. So you go to your provider, psychiatrist, or primary care, and you want either anxiety medication or you want a sleeping medication. Of course, if you take sleeping medications, it makes it easier to fall down on the way to the bathroom at night. One key thing about population health management is it doesn't work well when you segment and subcontract out your different areas of care. It really is about the whole patient. The behavioral health impacts the physical health and vice versa. The pharmacy interacts deeply with the general medical care. You need to have data registry and data systems that combine your pharmacy data with your uh, medical data that has procedures and diagnoses. And I think increasingly payers that segment out that risk or segment those business operations will be less successful. It's about the whole patient, which means it needs to be about having all that management and data in the end aggregated in a workable database. Go ahead, please. Care coordination is coordinating uh, pa patient care across multiple caregivers, implementing a plan of care, and particularly planning hospital discharge and following up after discharge, which bleeds over into, go ahead, uh, I'll, I'll skip this slide in the interest of time. I'm more verbose today than I thought. Go ahead. Which bleeds over into transitions of care. You know, another area of data that I think as payers we need to push the information down to the providers is almost every payer requires initial authorization of stay. We make the hospitals call us up and tell us when somebody's getting admitted. But almost not, but it's rare for payers to then take that information and give it back to the treating physicians. All of us payers know who's treated the physician lately. We've gotten their claims. If we know that that person's now in the hospital, why wouldn't we tell that treating, that recently treating physician, hey, your patient's in the hospital for the same complaint that you treated them for last month? That's allowable under HIPAA. It's better coordination of care, and it's a real clinical value add 
the payers could provide to support the treatment system. We're doing that in Missouri in our health home operations, and we're doing it in our general Medicaid population. Uh, the initial authorization of stay desk uh, data gets downloaded overnight to a little database that sends out sorted emails uh, to their assigned health homes, so everybody gets a notice and all the uh, nurse care managers get a notice in the morning of everybody that was admitted the night before. Uh, we do the same thing with emergency room visits. We're able to get emergency room visits because if you remember after 9-11, there was the anthrax scare. At that point, the federal government required hospitals to report all ER visits and the reason for them in identifiable form to their State Department of Health. That means your State Department of Health knows when everybody goes in the ER within an hour or so. So we were able to arrange with our State Department of Health for the subpopulation that we manage to get that data feed overnight so we can let our home, our home providers, our practice providers of health homes, uh, know when their patients have been in the ER. I think all systems should be looking for this kind of already aggregated data and pushing it out as fresh as possible, whether it's administrative data with clinical values or public health data with clinical values, if it's something you as a doctor, you think your doctor would want to know, we ought to find a way to push it down to them. Let me move on to why this is particularly important in the behavioral health sector. Well, first of all, the Accountable Affordable Care Act requires it. There are multiple sections in the Affordable Care Act that directly promote and require integration of primary care and behavioral health. One of the biggest sections is the expansion of mental health parity to a much broader part of the insurance market than applied to previously. Health home program, section 2703, explicitly requires it. There are multiple other sections. Second, people with serious mental illness, SMI, are in general sicker than people without mental illness, and I'll show you some data on that. Second, population management needs behavioral health to succeed. As I showed you early, much of health determinants are around behavioral issues. And finally, fourth, there's a shortage of psychiatrists in particular. Uh, they are aging out rapidly, and there's simply not going to be enough of them to treat the population using the current methods, and I think population health management can really help us extend this extremely limited resource. Go ahead. So the uh, Affordable Care Act, you can think of it in three silos, uh, coverage expansion, payment reform, and quality improvement. Uh, go ahead. Population health management in the ACA, here's some of what's required. Community health needs assessment, expansion of prevention and wellness services, hospital readmission reduction programs. These are all population health management approaches and are part of why I argue that the Affordable Care Act is a major engine pushing the whole industry towards population health management. Accountable care organizations are a form of population health management, patient-centered patient medical homes, health homes for chronic conditions, there's increased funding for health centers. The federally qualified health centers are required to think of themselves as the public health entity for the uh, patients that are treated in them. Go ahead. It's going to be, it's a heavy lift to change all of this, to change from a provider-managed health rather than plan-managed health. Uh, we found that patients respond more to a face-to-face -face interaction with a provider they know that's giving their care than an anonymous person over the phone or a mailed intervention. We're like that. Human beings are like that. We're more likely to respond to a request from somebody we know, and more likely when we've had a face-to-face -face interaction than when we've had virtual or telephone interactions. This is going to require the providers to develop new skill sets and the payers to take on new policies, uh, and there, uh, several of them are listed here. Go ahead. Important provider competencies. Providers are going to be doing care, are required more and more in their performance-based contracts to do care coordination, to do care management, to use the kind of tools that I described earlier, and to clinically integrate across multiple types of care, in particular behavioral health care and primary care. Go ahead. 
Let me go on to why this is particularly important for behave, people with behavioral health conditions. Here we see some life expectancy results. People with no mental disorder in the general population live until about 78 years of age. People with any mental disorder in the general population live until about age 65, about 12 years lower life expectancy for any mental disorder. For people with serious mental illness in the public mental health system, they live until their mid-50s, about 25 years lower life expectancy than the general population. This is kind of a hidden epidemic. You know, this is a life expectancy on a par with Sub-Saharan Africa, and it's a lower life expectancy than we see in people newly diagnosed with HIV. Proceed. So much of this is not due to it's not due to suicide. It's due to chronic medical illness. When we subdivided the cause of uh, the excess mortality in people with serious mental illness in these studies, 88% of the premature deaths, years of life loss, and 80% of the pre premature deaths are due to medical conditions: heart disease, respiratory illness, diabetes. There was a national study comparing antipsychotics, but as part of those of that comparison, they looked at a number of medical factors. So for people with schizophrenia in the years of oh, about 2000 to 2004, going to university medical centers that can do multi, national multi-center research, people with schizophrenia going to academic clinics, these, this group, 88% of people with schizophrenia had dyslipidemia, 62.4% had hypertension, and 30% had diabetes. And this is confounded a little. Of each of these, about half of those with dyslipidemia were not getting treated. About half of those with hypertension were not getting treated. And about a third of those with diabetes were not getting treated. Proceed. Here's the incidence of metabolic syndrome in this population for people with, and the Katie column are, is the schizophrenia study. The N. Haynes is a survey of the whole population of the United States done by the CDC every three to five years. So this compares general population to people with schizophrenia. Metabolic syndrome is having three out of five factors. It's having uh, being overweight, here measured by waist circumference. It's having dyslipidemia, here measured by high triglycerides or low levels of the good protective cholesterol, HDL. Having high blood pressure or having poor glucose control, diabetic or prediabetic. So in the general population, about one in, uh, one in five men have metabolic syndrome. Among men with schizophrenia, it's one in three. For women, it's about one in four in the general population, and it's 50-50. When you see a woman with schizophrenia, she's more likely to have three of these five risk factors than not. Why is this important? If you have metabolic syndrome, three out of five of the risk factors, you are as likely to have a heart attack in the next 10 years as somebody that's already had a heart attack. These are serious, uh, they're serious increased mortality, morbidity associated with this. Take a look at the rates of these illnesses. 50% uh, with dyslipidemia, 50% uh, with elevated blood pressure. Proceed. So these are people that have high rates of chronic medical illness and low rates of treatment. 50% with dyslipidemia and 88% not being treated. 50% with hypertension and half not being treated. This is a population that has high rates of chronic illness and low rates of adequate treatment, and most of them have coverage because they're disabled. The other causes of excess mortality in people with mental illness is smoking. Smoking rates are much higher in people with substance abuse and mental illness disorders. They're more likely to be overweight, more likely to be inactive. inactive. Many of them get more medications that are good for them, polypharmacy, and have addressed the underdiagnosis and inadequate treatment. Proceed. How does this reflect in costs? Uh, this is data from a Milliman study from 2013. In the private sector, people with no mental disorder cost about $370 per member per month in commercial insurance. Those with any mental disorder, including substance abuse, average up around 1,200 in this Milliman study. In Medicare, and this includes both the disabled and the elderly, so it's an average of two distinctly different populations, the average with no mental disorder is $600 per member per month. The average of a person with any mental disorder is over twice that. 
In Medicaid, again, a whole population average combining those, the TANF and CHIP, the pregnant women and children, by and large healthy, with the elderly and disabled, by and large very sick. The average payment is for just under 400, because the bulk of people in Medicaid are women and children. But those with any mental disorder, it's again three times as much. People with behavioral health disorders cost significantly more than people without behavioral health disorders. Proceed. Here's some data from New York State's Medicaid program. The take home point here is that at least Half of that increased cost is due to their increased physical health costs, not to their behavioral health costs. Here we see people in New York Medicaid cost about $16,000 a year, a very expensive system, New York Medicaid. And their increased physical health costs, if they have a substance use or mental health disorder, is approximately an additional $6,000, dollars $6,000, which is about as much as all their behavioral health costs. When you see a person with behavioral health, they're very likely to have increased medical illness. And whenever you take a look at an expensive population in a payment system, you find a large fraction of people with behavioral health conditions. This is why population management is important for behavioral health and why behavioral health is important if you're going to succeed in population health management. You can't address one population without being forced to deal with the other. Go ahead. Also, as, as stated early in the presentation, many of the determinants of health are behavioral. In this, uh, this is another uh, study from ASTHO, the public health group. Uh, in, in this study, 40% of the premature deaths were attributable to behavior patterns, with a relatively small amount being attributed to the health care received. Go ahead. Easier to change behavior than to change genetics. The final reason, before I go into our example of how we applied population health management in Missouri, is the psychiatrist shortage. I believe that population health management is important in the behavioral health sector because basically we're running out of psychiatrists. The demand exceeds the supply. The, psych the psychiatric uh, the demand is increasing, and the workforce is shrinking. I do not believe the current psychiatric care delivery model is sustainable. Proceed. The best study on psychiatry workforce was done by University of North Carolina, funded by HRSA in 2009, the report came out. It found that 77% of U.S. counties have a severe shortage of prescribers with over half their meat unmet. 96% of U.S. counties have some unmet need. Pretty much every county that isn't in the middle of a major urban city has some unmet need. Proceed. So what are the drivers of increased demand for psychiatric services? Well, the Parity Act released a lot of pent-up demand, and the Accountable Care Act, Affordable Care Act extended parity, releasing uh, increasing coverage yet further, which released pent-up demand. Stigma is dropping, which means people are willing to say, yes, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, I'm having funny symptoms that are upsetting my thinking. They're not as ashamed as they used to be. And of course, the uh, recent press coverage of mass shootings, uh, one strategy that we seem to agree on nationally is people would rather focus on mental health services than gun control, but that drives demand. As I mentioned before, people with mental illness are the general health care spend high utilizers, which increases demand. There's more demand for behavioral health primary care integration by payers. And if there's fewer psychiatrists, then demand's up. Most of us that are psychiatrists get postcards with job offers, oh, one or two a week, easy. Go ahead. The estimated need for psychiatrists is about 26 per 100,000 population. If we take a U.S. population of 300 million, which is low, we're actually more like 350 million, this would be 78,000 psychiatrists. There are currently about 48,000 psychiatrists. So the current gap is we're short by 30,000. It's a bigger gap for child and adolescents. Also, psychiatrists are aging out faster. Uh, internists, pediatricians, obstetricians, uh, the average median age is in their mid-30s, mid to late 30s. The average median age for psychiatry is 55. 
55% of all current psychiatrists are older than 55 years old. We're going to fall off a cliff. It's going to get worse. Go ahead. Here's a projection of uh, workforce demand in general. So for physician supply in general, you see the demand, the red line outstripping it. The production of psychiatrists is dead flat, proceed, and demand is increasing. It'll be worse for them than for all in general. So I've gone through what I mean by population health, what I mean by population health management, and why that's important for healthcare reform in general and behavioral health in particular. Now I'm going to go over health homes. Health home is a section, it's a funding mechanism for a section of the Affordable Care Act, Section 2703. But in Missouri, we've not used it just as a benefit, not as a separate program. We've used it as a way to really transform our community mental health centers and our federally qualified health centers and some other primary care practices into doing population health management, to doing data-based care. The payments for health home services are paid on a per-member, per-month basis. Uh, the service needs and the enrollment is by health status and history, and it involves a lot of outcome and performance measurement. Proceed. So our strategy is to uh, do case management, care coordination, and facilitate health care. We use primary care nurse care managers that we've added to both the behavioral health practices and to the primary care practices. Uh, we have the CMHCs and the FQHCs doing disease management for people with multiple complex problems and severe mental illness. Uh, they're doing preventive care care screenings. We are currently up to a 83% of everybody in the health homes has a complete metabolic screen, including uh, hemoglobin A1C, LDL, blood pressure, weight. Uh, a couple of them are up at 90%. We use health technology to support the system. We believe that care coordination is best provided by a local face-to-face -face interaction with community-based providers. These community mental health centers for decades have had mental health community support workers who have that face-to-face -face relationship and are already paid for. So we've retrained them to be general health care navigators. They've received training in general wellness. They've received condition-specific training in asthma, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and they're guided and instructed by primary nurse care managers. They are targeted. The primary care health homes have received behavioral health consultants to assist primary care with behavioral interventions for medical illnesses and with addressing and identifying behavioral health conditions. Next slide. So I've gone over the difference between treatment as usual, an individual practitioner waiting for a patient to come in with a complaint. Uh, I would argue that managed care focuses more on increasing access and managing utilization, but that managed care usually does not focus on changing actual clinical practice. It doesn't focus on getting individual practices to re-engineer how they do care internally. Health homes, we do expect them to change their work processes, to use data tools. We track it if they use it or don't use it. If they're not using it, they get a financial penalty. If they don't have the required staffing model, they get a financial penalty. It's continuous team-driven care. Proceed. So who did we enroll? In primary care, if you had diabetes alone, we enrolled you, or if you had any two of the following chronic conditions. Uh, asthma, COPD, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, being overweight, smoker, or developmentally disabled. We added developmentally disabled to make them eligible for this enhanced uh, care coordination services. They have a lot of different illnesses. They're pretty fragile. They needed the service. CMHCs, community mental health centers, if they had a serious mental illness alone, they were eligible or if they had any other behavioral health condition that was not serious plus any one of those listed. But we didn't enroll everybody. These are the eligibles. The people that were auto-enrolled were in the CMHCs, anybody that cost more than 10000 in the previous year, and in primary care, anybody that cost more than 5000 So it's important when you think about health homes, it's different than person-centered medical homes. Not everybody is in, not all eligibles are in. In a person-centered medical home, everybody 
from that payer in the practice would get a small per member per month, around oh three to eleven dollars. In a health home for chronic condition, only people with two or more chronic conditions in general get it. This is also more like a Camden hotspot. And even of those with chronic conditions, we only enrolled those that were high utilizers within that subgroup. So our health home model is a combination of a person-centered medical home with a hotspot. It's kind of a hotspot within a person-centered medical home. Proceed. We are statewide with all providers, all of our 28 CMHCs, 120 sites statewide. Uh, are in this program and they're treating about 19,000 people at any given point in time. Primary care, all of our FQHCs are in, 67 different clinic sites, and six other uh, hospitals with their 36 clinics are included, about 16,000 people in at any given time. Proceed. Uh, they operate with one team. They don't have a separate health home team that's separate from the primary care team or separate from the uh, community support psychiatric rehab team. In the community mental health centers, the team is composed of the community rehab staff they had previously, plus a primary care nurse care manager and a primary care consultant. The CMHCs all now have primary care nurses to do care management and a primary care physician to consult with the mental health staff on how to identify gaps of chronic medical illness, to build relationships with the primary care practices around town, to assist with complicated individual cases. But it's for management, not for actual delivery of care. The primary care health homes uh, also got nurse care managers, they got a behavioral health consultant, both of them got a health home director. If you expect a practice to change how they do business, you have to fund some administrative resource. Organizations can't change without administrative effort. Those of us that are payers, if we want administrative change, our rates or we have to or some other payment mechanism must support the increased administrative demand to create the change. Uh, they're required to have one treatment plan that includes rehab behavioral goals, medical goals, and healthy lifestyle goals. The health homes are 80% uh, primary care and, and community mental health center health home programs are 80% identical. About two-thirds of their performance indicators are the same for both. The CMHC health homes do a wraparound approach since they don't provide primary care. They provide care management, coordination, uh, and transition of care to primary care practices that are not health homes. Many primary care practices do not have this wherewithal. The CMHCs wrap these services around them and assist those primary care physicians. Next slide. Here's the staffing model, nurse care manager for every 250 patients, a care coordinator, an assistant to the nurse care manager for every 500 patients, a health home director, as I mentioned, behavioral health consultants for the primary care health homes and a primary care physician consultant for behavioral health, a lot of collaborative and required training. They get next day notification of hospital admissions and now ER visits. Proceed. So here's some of our performance. Uh, I'm going to give you some performance outcomes. First we'll go clinical, then we'll go financial. I want to make first the point that small differences in metabolic syndrome indicators make a big difference in mortality. A 10% reduction in blood cholesterol over 10 years yields a 30% reduction in cardiovascular disease. A six-point drop in high blood pressure over 10 years yields a 16% reduction in cardiovascular disease and a 42% reduction in stroke. And a 1% reduction in your hemoglobin A1C over 10 years will yield a 21% decrease in diabetes-related deaths and 14% decrease in myocardial infarction and a 37% decrease in things like blindness, neuropathy, renal disease, the microvascular complications. So although the changes look small, on a population basis, they make a big difference. This is part of thinking in terms of population health in addition to individual clinical, individual patient situation. Go ahead. So for our hemoglobin A1C, initially about 7% of the population had uncontrolled elevated hemoglobin A1C, an indicator of being pre-diabetic or diabetic. 
uh, the group that had elevated hemoglobin A1C had at least a 1% reduction. Those that had a normal hemoglobin A1C, the other 93%, only went up by about 0.1%, not a clinical meaningful change. In LDL, which is triglycerides dyslipidemia, cholesterol, it's a form of cholesterol, about 45% of people in the community mental health center health homes had elevated uh, cholesterol levels, LDL. The groups with elevated LDL showed more than a 10% reduction, but those that had a normal, it went up about seven points, about a 5% increase. So we did good at reducing high cholesterol, but didn't hold the line as well at preventing people from progressing to higher cholesterol. Proceed. For blood pressure control, initially about 20 to 24% had uncontrolled blood pressure levels. Uh, those with elevated blood pressure all had at least a 6% drop in both their systolic and diastolic. And in every group, because we enrolled sequentially multiple groups, the pressure dropped below 140 over 90, which is the limit, the upper limit of normal. So as a population, they got their pressure from above normal to below normal. The uh, pressure did increase by one to five points on the normal group, so it crept up some. We did not do as well as holding the line on blood pressure on those that were already normal, but were effective on getting those that were abnormal down. We need to get better on prevention. Go ahead. But still, even with that increase, go back one, they were still well below abnormal. Even with the five-point increase, they were still averaging 120 over 70, well below the 140 over 90 cut level. Proceed. Those are population health measures, but you'll say, Joe, but where are the HEDIS measures? Well, we're kind of unenthused with HEDIS measures because they are narrow. They are narrow clinic measures and not really population measures. Why would I only care about your cholesterol or your hemoglobin A1C after you get diabetes? Why shouldn't I be looking at your blood pressure before you get hypertension? But here's the HEDIS indicators since they are the industry standard, even though they're narrow. Uh, the goals are from the Healthy 2020 goal. February 2012 is one is uh, one year into our program. February 13, no, I'm sorry, February 2012 is at the beginning. February of 13 is one year in, and June of 13 is 18 months in. So we started out of people with cardiovascular disease, 21% had their LDLs measured and under control, and you see it increases to 37% then to 49%, approaching the national goal, not there yet. For control of blood pressure for people with hypertension, similar progression of people with measurement and under control. This shows how this program over time increase, improves the HEDIS indicate, health status as measured by HEDIS indicators. Proceed. This looks at HEDIS indicators for people with diabetes. The common indicators, uh, HEDIS indicators for diabetics is cholesterol control, LDL, blood pressure control, and hemoglobin A1C control. Read the same way as the previous graph, the red is the national goal from Healthy Persons 2020. Uh, the first gray bar is our baseline, followed by year one, followed by uh, 18 months. Proceed. Let's talk money. It wouldn't be U.S. healthcare if we weren't worried about money. So for the Community Mental Health Center, health homes, there are 20,000 people served at 18 months total. Uh, their intervention cost $80 per member per month. We paid, they earned back their $80 and saved another $76 on top of that. This is an expensive intervention at $80, but they earned it back in savings and saved another 76 on top. Total program savings, 15.7 million. Primary care, 23,000 people in. They have more churn in and out than the community mental health centers. Their per member per month payment is $60. They earned that $60 back, saved another $30.79. Total program savings, $7.4 million. So the health homes in aggregate are 43,000 people. Uh, the average reduction is about $52 per member per month. Total program savings is $23 million. We have a separate program that is straight up hotspots. These are all the CMHC and 
primary care health homes are all about people that were already engaged in those practices. This is getting better at people that you already have in your practice. Our, se our second program, we look for people with serious mental illness who are not engaged in services, community mental health center services, and cost more than $20,000 a year, and then the CMHCs go out and look for them. They literally knock on their doors and ask them if they can't help them. We've been able to engage an additional 3,500 people. The cost savings there is $600 per member per month. Save $22 million in this smaller, more acute cohort. This is straight up hot spotting. Go ahead. So the big change here is that it's required a significant change in how the practices think about what they're doing. They need to think about caring for an entire population, not just the individuals who actively seek care. It's been of changing how they do business. Uh, health information technology is absolutely necessary, but it's not sufficient. It also required a lot of committed leadership at the executive practice level. Proceed. The other thing it required was a lot of trust, a lot of collaboration. Uh, the state, as a payer, used the providers as internal state staff. We used Primary Care Association and Community Mental Health Center Coalition people in writing the state plan amendment to Medicaid and developing the payment rates and developing the performance definitions, uh, the indicators. We used them as internal staff early on. We did not hold them at arm's length. The relationship is more than a contract. Uh, we use our data transparently. We tolerate and share risks together. And we talk a lot about the relationship. A relationship is not just a contract. It's an ongoing commitment over a long period of time. Next slide. Some of my favorite partnerships, do's and don'ts. You know, we don't often don't talk about what it takes to be a partner. We talk about the business at hand, but we don't talk about how we do business. In Missouri, we talk directly about how we do business. Uh, you know, I think you'll find that there's one common factor in all your disappointing relationships that don't go the way you want them to, and that's you. You're the only common factor in all your disappointing relationships. To change your partner, you have to change yourself first. So if you're going to be a good partner, you don't talk about what you need first. You ask what their needs are. And you don't expect to get something. You give them something that addresses their needs. You don't limit your assistance to the project before you. You assist them however you can with their whole book of business. You don't make it about the one deal before you. You make it about the next 10 deals. Most of the people we do business with will be doing business with in a decade. You don't push for a particular position. You identify and pursue common interests. You don't withhold information. You reveal everything that could be helpful. And most importantly, if your partner is going to get beat up in public, either financially or in the press or politically, and you can help them out, you take the lump for them. If you take the lump, if you take a hit for your partner, you have a partner that will stick with you. You know, too often, particularly in behavioral health, we've sought partners by whining that we're underfunded, that we're misunderstood, we're not valued, we're poorly treated, or, you know, we don't have the funding the rest of the sector does. We go and people should give us their funding and help. We whine a lot. That's not successful. I've actually done empirical research on this. When I was in college, I would go to drinking establishments and identify potential partners who had resources that I desired. I would tell them how deeply I felt my need and how nice their resources were, and I went home alone a lot. So when I was working for Department of Mental Health and I wanted to partner with Medicaid, I told them they had really interesting problems and I wanted to hear more about their problems. And then I gave them little gifts of administrative manpower and bits of funding to help Medicaid with their, fun with their problems out of the mental health budget. And now we're good partners. You get your, a good partner helps the other party so much that that party is helpless without them. That's partnership. Proceed. That's the end of my stated comments. So I'm Great. ready for questions. Thank you for hearing me out. Excellent, excellent. Uh, this has been a, uh, a fantastic presentation uh, and um, lots of information about how to uh, and uh, the, the real work of integration and transition from where we are to where it is we want to be. 
So uh, we're going to open it up for questions, but before we do, uh, let me just uh, provide a, uh, a announcement regarding upcoming webinars. The next webinar uh, will be dated uh, January 29, 2015 at 12 uh, p.m., and it's going to be entitled How Health Information Exchanges Are Supporting Population Health Management. Uh, and this session will examine uh, the uh, health information exchanges. Uh, and uh, all kinds of good information about uh, the current issues associated with sustain, uh, sustainability, privacy, security, data integrity, and the like. We'll have very uh, informative speakers, Lee Bar Barrett, Executive Director, Electronic Healthcare Network Accreditation Committee, and Irene Koch, Executive Vice President, General Counsel of Helix. So we invite you all to attend. Uh, and uh, and to get that good information. And with that, we will open it up for questions. Uh, so if you have any questions, please uh, uh, type them in on the chat line, and I see we have some uh, uh, coming over uh, as we speak. But uh, let me let me start, uh, uh, Dr. Parks, with uh, the performance benchmarking and um, you know, using aggregate data. And uh, I, I understand that doctors are scientists, so ultimately if you can provide them data that shows where they are as it relates to other people, you know, they're going to want to change their behavior to, to get to, to, to be in the mean, so to speak. Uh, but my question is about uh, what is effective training uh, in order for that to happen? I know uh, when, uh, when, when I was uh, working with a couple of health plans, they would have meetings of physicians to do physician training, and they'd have a dinner and invite them down, and some of them would come and some of them wouldn't. Uh, and, um, and, and more recently, uh, being involved in uh, some health homes, it seems like training really needs to be at their office which in, it, it requires a great deal of administrative uh, work in order to do the appropriate training. What's your thoughts about that? Yeah, we, we've made our training to be very reactive or responsive to what they say their current obstacle or pain point is. That way they're more likely to attend if it's something that they're complaining to us about rather than something we're complaining to them about. Uh, we do some of the training by uh, by by web conferences or by uh, video modules they can watch at any time, but that's not sufficient. We do some of the training by practice coaching. We got stuck after the first year of implementation, and it was really practice coaches that got us unstuck. Uh, so the practice coaches go out on site at least quarterly, and then every two weeks or month in between, depending on the practice, they'll have a follow-up phone call. The practice coach will be reviewing the performance data, the practice identifies goals, the coach asks what goals they acted on or didn't, you know, did you change what you said you were going to change last time or didn't you get around to it, what are you going to do about this? Practice coaching was huge for us. And, and what, for what, the what new roles, we also, we also had to convene them in groups. You know, we're asking them to take on a new professional identity. And we found it was important to occasionally get them together about twice a year or once a year. So we'd get all the primary care physician consultants and we'd take a couple hours giving them some information. But then we'd take a couple hours breaking them into small groups and having them discuss what was working and what wasn't working so they could form a new group identity of what it is to be a primary care physician consultant. Now practice, practice coaching, when you say practice coaching, what do you mean? I mean that I mean that we uh, we hired either recently retired agency senior leaders or recently retired state senior leaders. These are people that have relationships that are respected. They are opinion leaders in our local treatment community, and we pay them to be part of our management team. 
and they go out to the CMHC and they go, well, here's your performance indicators and here's what the program's trying to do and here's the three, you know, what, what do you want to focus on getting better and here's one place the central state wants you to focus on getting better and what action steps can you commit to to do pursue in the next month to get better in two areas of your choosing and one area of the state's choosing. And I'll be back next month. Okay. All right. Excellent. And, and what was your experience with how the physicians... I want to say just a little more about that because we also had a learning collaborative that was run by an outside consulting group and we didn't get as much traction because they had an out-of-the-box product. They weren't as, it, it wasn't as reactive and responsive to what the local group said their pain was to. They had what they did and they were going to do it. We've gotten more traction with this because it's driven by the current complaint of the provider group and because it's people they know and that know their system. So I would urge people to the extent you can, you have to be reactive and if you can find them to use people that have intimate knowledge of your system to do this work. I mean, this is some of the key work that needs to be done in terms of uh, uh, arming uh, physicians with the information uh, to uh, do the analysis, to, to be aware of, of of how to use this data. Uh, uh, what was your experience with uh, the importance of having the, the right incentive uh, financially to get them to do it? Uh, let's see. Well, you know, we we uh, the way we came up with the number is we required them to do a a particular team mix that I showed you. You know, a nurse care manager for every 250 and so forth. And we backed into that cost. The eighty dollars per member per month was based on modeling that cost. So they're required to hire new staff specifically to do those functions. If they can't show us they've hired the new staff, then we take back the money. So I think what was sufficient incentive is we gave them a pretty big PMPM PM to get new warm bodies they didn't have, and then we directed, you know, we made sure that they actually used the new warm bodies for that and just didn't pocket our extra money as margin. Okay, I got you. And what was, did you, were you able to evaluate how the physicians felt about it? Uh, the uh, So the primary care physicians at this point are more enthusiastic than the psychiatrists. The psychiatrists at the CMHCs we've not engaged as well as the primary care physicians. Uh, we're getting there with them. Uh, we didn't have the nurse care managers integrated enough with them. The primary care docs love it. They particularly love having behavioral health consultants, you know, that per member per month paid for not only a nurse care manager but a behavioral health person to shadow them around. Oh, okay. okay. You know, Clifford, I have one question here I'll take up from uh, one of our listeners who asked who's responsible for paying the primary nurse care managers working with each health home. Uh, this is a Medicaid payment. So this is the $60 per member per month or the $80 per member per month is a Medicaid payment that goes to the health home uh, for each person in a month that they receive service from the health home. So it is a substantial payment but we require them to hire substantial staff and we only enroll people with substantial costs. So it's not a small payment for everybody. It's a big payment. We don't let them choose who's going to get enrolled. We choose who's enrolled. The payer chooses who's enrolled. And then we hold them accountable for what they do with the money. So it's a little, it's different than a person-centered medical home. I imagine that's the model most of your listeners or most of the people on the webinar are familiar with. Now, you, you talked a little bit about the, the psychiatric shortage and, um, uh, and how does uh, um, psychology, the, does psychology fit into meeting that shortage in any way or what's your sense of how psychologists can be used? Psychologists are very useful as behavioral health consultants. They're very useful for getting behavioral change, for diagnosing. Uh, they, they, uh, they, of course, don't do prescribing, and the physicians want somebody to assist them on how to prescribe psychiatric medications. Uh, 
they also are are not uh, are not as helpful on the interaction between psychiatry and medical conditions that cause psychiatric symptoms. Uh, but uh, they are they are the best you can do for a behavioral health consultant, and they're a key part of the mix here. Yeah. So you know, as we're moving towards integrating behavioral health and 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 physical health, and and there is, I think, a much greater sense that you know, for chronic conditions, you really need to uh, address the behavioral health issues. Uh, you know, how do you see this rolling out over these? next year or two or three or four or five, given given the shortages? So I, I think the, some of the key interventions is I, I think co-location is key, that we have to have the behavioral health people in the same place that the uh, primary care people are. And by co-location, I don't mean on a separate floor in the building, and I don't mean that they have you know, the front right corner of the clinic and everybody else is in the other three corners. I'm integrated as a psychiatrist when I can't walk to the bathroom without going past primary care people, and when the primary care person can't make it to get a cup of coffee without walking past me. You have to literally be bumping into each other all the time to have that kind of moment-to-moment -moment personal interaction, to be comfortable interrupting each other in the interview room, to pass patients back and forth. That's, I think many times people talk down about co-location because they put them in the same organization but in different buildings, or they put them in the same building but in different floors, or even in the same clinic. Let's put the behavioral health people over there. And by the way, let's give them a separate waiting room. Yeah, that's just another form of ghetto. That's just another form of ghetto. I think the other way we'll see it happening more because we still won't have enough psychiatrists to get them all, you know, one in every clinic. Uh, I think you're going to see uh, more telemedicine consultations. And I think, you're, you know, there's a model out of New Mexico called ECHO that kind of is a video way of doing medical school tile teaching. When we did medical school, it was all see one, do one, teach one. So under the ECHO model, you get a group of clinics, and they get on the video comm every couple weeks, and there'll be three brief presentations from three different clinics of a patient that they're worried about to a team. Uh, it started out with hepatitis treatment. I think we'll, uh, it's also done with psychiatry and addiction. So in the psychiatry example, it would be a psychiatrist and a psychologist and maybe a community caseworker. And the, part one, the first primary care clinic would say, here's Joe and here's his problems, what do we do? And the multidisciplinary team would talk about that patient. So it's advice to primary care about a particular patient, but you have six other clinics on listening, and they're all thinking, oh, I got a guy like him. I could do that too. So I think that model will help be a real force multiplier and allow primary care to pick up a lot of psychiatric treatment and prescribing. And I think that paired with having psychologists in the clinics and mental health social workers in the clinics uh, will be the predominant model. But us psychiatrists are going to be by and large consultants as opposed to the people doing the bulk of the direct treatment because there's just not enough to meet everybody's needs otherwise. Right, right. And our price point's very high. Our unit cost is very high. Let me ask you a question about this, the, the HEDIS uh, measures, because that's typically what uh, uh, states uh, want managed care companies to hit. Uh, and so do you see the, the uh, states evolving from HEDIS measures into more population health type measures in managed care uh, as well, or uh, what, what is your sense about that in terms of the measurement for managed care? Uh, you know, that, that's where uh, I don't know if we'll change from that or not. The reason the states ask for it is that's what NCQA requires. And, of course, NCQA is an outgrowth of the managed care industry as a group. So it, it gets to be kind of circular. The problem with the HEDIS indicators is they are more disease-specific based. It's not a population measure. It's a disease-specific measure, and most people with chronic illness have more than one disease. And HEDIS measures are carefully designed to 
avoid false positives at the cost of false negatives. They want to make very sure they don't say something's bad unless you're really, really sure it's bad and are willing to miss a number of things that are bad in the service of that. You know, uh, they're narrow. They have small denominators, which, I mean, that, that's, the, that's the problem I have with them. Uh, I think you're going to see more alternative measures required in addition to HEDIS. The nice thing is that the, you know, the databases and analytic tools are getting better, so it's getting easier and easier to do modifications to any indicator and say, well, I know they run it like that at NCQA, but I'd like these three criteria removed and that one changed, and this is our local variant. So I would urge everybody to get a good analytic tool package where you can modify whatever the current standard ones are out there. Uh, Glenn, I think we got maybe time for one more. D disease registries, uh, those are fairly, uh, uh, do you see that based as hospital-based? Uh, do you see that as uh, public uh, or clinic-based? Where, where I, I think, yeah, I, I think that that's a key. It's kind of like a local question and answer. Do you want each individual practice to have its own registry? And then if you compare performance, the practices report denominators and denominators to the payer. Or does the payer want to run a central registry that they ask all their providers to use? We went the central route. And we did that in part because most of our providers didn't have a registry anyway, and if they didn't have one, we thought we ought to just give them one rather than tell them to build 50 different ones. Now, in other areas, you know, if it's uh, there may be other areas of the country, maybe the providers all got registries and they're using them, and you don't want to tear away somebody away from something they're already comfortable with and using. So I think it's a local implementation decision. Uh, it also depends on what level you want the business managed. Do you want to manage it more centrally at a payer level and be directly responsible for that level of granularity, or do you want to push that down to the providers? Uh, I find that when I have the actual clinical values, I can hold my providers more accountable. Then I know if their data is good or not. We had, you know, we repeatedly had the providers saying, oh, no, that number isn't right. And, you know, we finally got down and get chart audits. The number was right. But we couldn't have done that with them if we didn't get the raw actual clinical numbers. Uh, I think whoever actually has the raw data is the manager. So if you intend to be the manager of the system, you ought to insist on running the registry yourself. If you want somebody else to manage the system for you, then let them run the registry. Depends on who you want to hold accountable for the actual management. Right. I hold myself accountable. Let me ask a question just about from, from your, uh, as a professor, and uh, do, you, do you see any of this approach seeping into the training that uh, psychiatrists get or physicians get with respect to uh, care management, population Only management? Only those that take a rotation in the in this area and in, in practices doing this, I think the training in the formal training uh, that gets a certification is uh, lagging far behind. I think the only place people get it is if they do a fellowship around this or if they end up having some of their clinical placements in practices that do this kind of work. But the formal requirements from the board are uh, lagging far behind where the field is. It a problem. So, so that, uh, so when we think about uh, physicians, for example, uh, you know, their their understanding of utilizing data and looking at data and population health, that that's something that, for the most part, is fairly foreign to them. So, when they get out in the marketplace, it, it there's a there's a, a real curve that they have to reach. Do you see yeah, that? And, and the biggest resistance they have is expecting some form of responsibility for the care that's delivered to their patient by the other physicians. Uh, a, a significant subgroup of my colleagues wants to only pay attention to and be responsible for the one piece of care they do. 
the primary care internal medicine family practice guys are the best at accepting overall responsibility. Other physicians need to get better at that. That's that. Uh, they know how to use data. They just don't want to be responsible for what all the rest of us are doing. Yeah, yeah. The, there is some uh, work being done with uh, global budgets uh, and uh, and, um, and and you know data management so that uh, the primary care provider is responsible for the total continuum of care and every expenditure that uh, that uh, impacts the patient. Uh, and then is paid uh, additional based on shared serving savings and, and quality measures. Uh, what's your what's your thoughts about that as an incentive? Uh, uh, I I think that's great. You know that's part of what this program does is they they get you know their quality is tracked and we've done some shared savings payments also. Uh, I think it's important to have a mixture of payment methods. If you rely only on one payment method, then you'll get perverse incentives to game that one payment method. But you know, I, I'm th I, I'm thinking of a system where the base standard care is a per member per month with savings and quality, and then some of the some particular special odd treatments may still be at a fee for service. I like mixed payment methods. That that way, it's harder. You, you don't incentivize weird behavior to game the payment method as much if you have a mixture of payment methods. It is yeah. administratively more complex, uh, but human behavior is complex. You know, if you only have one way of getting rewarded, you do strange things to get that reward. We have to make complicated systems to get around the way we're wired. <laughs> Yeah. You, as usual, you know, we are the problem. It's it's not the rest of this stuff. It's us. <laughs> no, it's 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 very true. And trying to create a system that uh that that takes that into account is uh is, is challenging because we don't want to admit it necessarily. Oh, I, I'm I as a I'm both a regulator and a payer and a provider and I tell you the worst most recalcitrant the the provider I have the hardest time changing is me. Yeah. And and now and I, I mentioned that early on with your three hats. I mean that's uh, uh, that is a, a, a unique perspective that uh, that you have. And and so let me ask you, as a regulator, what what would you find? What do you think is the hardest thing that you had to do as a regulator? Because uh, you're you're informed as a provider, as a teacher. Uh, and uh, what, you, you, you know, and 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 most of the folks are going to be uh, dealing with regulators as opposed to being regulators. So, as a regulator, what was what was the most challenging thing for you? The hardest thing as a regulator is to decide what you're not going to do, what you're going to leave alone, and what you're going to ignore. There are so many things deserving of attention and time. It, you know, they far exceed the amount of time and resource you have to address them. Uh, so the, the problem isn't what areas you're going to do some additional data analysis, regulation, policy development. Uh, the, the problem is is deciding what you're going to have to leave alone. Gotcha. Okay. Well, well, let me uh, before we conclude. Uh, let me uh, turn it back uh, over to. Uh, All right. Thank you for joining us. This concludes today's webinar. In approximately two to three business days following the webinar, Epstein Becker Green will communicate the availability of today's webinar recording and the PowerPoint materials. Thank you. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you all. Appreciate the time.